All right, let's get started. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, we're going to talk about asynchronous programming in Java. What are the options we have, and uh, what what is a good option today, and what's a good option moving forward? Uh, my name is Venkat Subramaniam, and my email address is right there in case you want to reach uh, for any questions or comments. And uh, we're going to talk about two different major topics here. We'll talk about completable futures and, and talk about how we can do asynchrony with it. We'll talk about virtual threads as well and talk about what virtual threads provide and how we can make use of it. So we got a fairly good uh, comprehensive idea of what are the different things we can do. And then when it comes to the topic of virtual threads, I'll talk about some do's and don'ts, uh, things we may want to think about uh, you know, doing more, uh, think about things we should avoid, and how we can benefit from that as well. So uh, with that said, uh, we're going to run for approximately about an hour and 20 minutes. And then we will take a, a 20 minutes break uh, for you to uh, move around a little bit, refill your liquids, use the facilities. And then we will come back and finish up the second part right after that. Uh, with that said, let's get started. Uh, we often uh, talk about concurrent programming. We talk about parallel programming. And, uh, and a lot of times, it's pretty confusing. What does it mean to program in parallel? What does it mean to program concurrently? Uh, that is something that uh, no matter who it is, you could be an expert in the field, you could be a beginner, but oftentimes we kind of get stumped on these uh, thoughts, like what does it really mean to be parallel? What does it really mean to be concurrent? So if you really think about you know, parallel versus concurrent, you can uh, think about the execution. And in thinking about execution, in, in what sequence do code actually get executed, is the question you want to ask. Well, I just demoed parallel versus concurrent. You probably noticed it. So the point about parallel versus concurrent is exactly that. I can walk and talk in parallel. I didn't have to stop to say a few words, or I didn't have to uh, you know, uh, you know, yield one task from another. I was able to talk and, uh, and walk exactly at the same time. So when it comes to a parallel, you can think about a parallel as if you take a, 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 a period of time, some interval of time, if you will, um, I was able to walk during that uh, you know, time, not a problem, but I was also, in the exact same time, able to uh, talk as well. I didn't have to pause talking, I didn't have to pause walking, and I was able to do both of those things in that duration of time. So if you were to consider this, that's basically a, a parallel execution. Um, what's also interesting is, in this particular time slice, if you were to look at a particular instance in time, at that moment, I was uttering words, but also taking steps. Uh, if you were to capture that moment, I'll have my leg awkward trying to walk and my mouth really open awkward to say a word, those are the worst pictures to be taken, but that shows that I'm doing it in parallel. That's really about parallelism, if you will. On the other hand, if you think about uh, concurrent uh, you know, programming, uh, if you were to take this one more time, I can talk, uh, but I can drink. But I would not dare uh, to talk and drink at the same time. Uh, that's rude to begin with. It's not very civilized, but it can also be really dangerous to one's life. I could choke up if I try to talk and uh, drink at the same time. So no sensible human will try to talk and drink at the same time. So you could say, hey, you want to uh, you know, talk, uh, and maybe once every few words you utter, you want to really take a break, and you want to drink uh, during that particular time. So if I'm going to be drinking water, I'm not going to speak for 30 minutes, let's say, and then say, hey, folks, we got to wait for five minutes because it's my time to drink water. Yeah, yeah, that would be very awkward. But I'm talking, and I might politely take a pause when I'm compiling some code. I could sip some water, say a few words again, sip some water. But if you look at the time period, in the, in the entire time duration, I took so many steps as I was walking, I spoke so many words because I was talking. Similarly, if you take a time period, 
I spent, uh, took so many sips of water. I also said so many words that I spoke as well. However, if you take a time slice and look at it, in that particular time slice, I was either talking uh, uh, or I was drinking, but not both. So that really becomes a concurrent execution in terms of how we do concurrency. So both tasks progress during a time period, but the resources somewhat limit as to which one we can actually do. So that generally becomes the parallel versus concurrent programming in, in how we may think about uh, these two activities. So, so we talked about parallel and concurrent, but that brings us to what does it really mean to program asynchronously? And, and, and a lot of times when we have these libraries that we use, Java provided the ability to do parallel uh, and, and concurrency from day number one. And that's one of the things I remember as a little aha moment for me. I uh, was programming pretty uh, heavily into C++ back in time uh, when I got, you know, got introduced to Java. This was the time when Java had just come out and, uh, and, and having done C++, uh, you had to really learn different multi-threading libraries if you wanted to program in, in C++. With, with Java, on the other hand, you had this beautiful uh, threading library that was provided in Java, and you could readily use that. So that was really very refreshing uh, when I saw that back in time. And, and so you could do multi-threading, and you could start threads, and you can do things. But, but most often, though, in Java, we did parallel and concurrent uh, for most part uh, for several years. Uh, we started spinning threads. And it's interesting to really observe the journey of Java, if you will. When Java 1.0 came out, we had uh, threads. And, and, and with threads, of course, you could, threads are considered to be lightweight, but you can create threads and you can create a pool of threads and you can use them. But quickly we realized that that may not be the best thing to do. And then, of course, we had to wait a little while, and Java 5 probably had the most significant update when it comes to uh, multi-threading. Remember the time of introduction of executors. So we had executors back in Java 5. We said, don't keep creating threads all over the place. That's really a bad idea. You want to create a pool of threads, and you want to schedule tasks on the pool. So executor services was really, really important for us to do. But if you really think about it, uh, Java has been around for 28 years, and now we are talking about multi-threading and threading one more time. And you kind of wonder, what's going on? Why do we keep talking about it? And I have a lesson of life that I kind of generalize and learn about it, and I think threading is really a good example of it. And, and that is, to summarize it, in, in both life and programming, we solve a set of problems only to realize, uh, uh, realize we have now created a new set of problems. So this is kind of the general trend uh, that I've noticed uh, really is uh, we solve a set of problems and then we are like, oops, and we ended up creating a new set of problems. And, and what executor services created in Java 5, this was definitely a, a great idea. And then we realized, oops, this is going to run into the uh, uh, pool-induced deadlocks. And pool-induced deadlocks were really annoying, isn't it? So enter Java 7, we had the fork uh, join uh, API. So the fork join API was introduced to solve that particular problem. We talked about word stealing and how we can use that to remove the problem of um, uh, pool-induced deadlocks. And of course, that was a really good move because that led us towards uh, solving another set of problems. And of course, Java 8 brought up some really amazing solution. We had parallel you know, streams and, of course, completable uh, a future as well was introduced in Java 8. Now, of course, now in Java 20 uh, and 21, we are talking about virtual threads now. Uh, why is that? So that's kind of the discovery and realization of uh, when we have new solutions, 
we begin to realize a new set of problems that are worth to solving. And so that journey continues. So maybe in three years from now, we'll talk about the problems we learned from virtual threads and, and we are going to solve it, which is, which is great, right? Because that's the journey. Otherwise, the world becomes a stagnant place, things become boring and we get old and die, nothing gets really done. That's kind of boring, right? That's not the life we want to die, you know, live in. So it's great to be able to find solutions to problems. And the beauty is when we learn something new, we find better solutions to solve those problems and then discover more and keep going. So, so that's basically uh, the question of this. So what does it really mean to be asynchronous? And, and I'll uh, absolutely admit to you that uh, I've been programming for, you know, give or take about 35 years now. And in, in my uh, life experience uh, so far, um, there are things I found to be really easy and there are things I found to be extremely hard. And, and when I look back at time, the things I found to be extremely hard, professionally that is, uh, are really not learning a language or learning a library, it really was the paradigm shift. So my very first paradigm shift was uh, learning to program itself. I, I remember those wonderful days when I was a, a young student and I'm trying to really learn programming and I didn't have access to computers back then. And, uh, and I solved algorithms on piece of paper until I found a computer eventually. And, and trying to know that you can actually do something on a computer, you can write code and you can make it crash was exciting. Uh, to know that you could actually run these code and take a look at the response. So that was my first paradigm shift. Uh, then my second paradigm shift, after I had started learning quite a bit along the way, my second paradigm shift was object-oriented programming. And uh, I came upon object-oriented programming very accidentally. And trying to learn about polymorphism, trying to learn about inheritance was a very exciting journey, but a steep learning curve trying to understand what does it mean to program object-oriented compared to the procedural code I was writing back then. Uh, the, the third paradigm shift I came across uh, really was distributed object computing. Uh, some of you are, are probably old enough to have done that in your lives. Some of you are probably young enough that you don't really have much experience in knowing what these are, and you are very lucky that you don't. Uh, for example, uh, in distributed object computing, I spent my misguided youth programming in COM and CORBA. And honestly, this is one of the things I fear the most. Imagine one of my kids calling me one day and saying, Dad, I just found out that you once wrote calm code. I don't know how I'm gonna take that day in my life. I, I'm still thinking, what should I prepare to tell my children when they find out that I'm, I was doing calm programming, or, or Corba for that matter. That was a very interesting journey. And, and honestly, I remember waking with the fog in my head. Uh, every morning I would wake up and I'm like, I don't get it, I don't get it. This distributed computing was really hard for me. Not because I couldn't get the code running, it's because I could and I didn't know why it's running and how it is doing. And they will talk about marshalling and factory methods and I'm like, enough of that, how does it really work? And, and of course, one day I wake up and like, whoa, I understand this stuff. But that was a paradigm shift for me to understand the distributed uh, object computing and, and the common CORBA business. And then, of course, as, as I went along, uh, one of the biggest journeys for me was uh, truly trying to understand functional programming. Uh, and, and what made really worst was everybody who did functional programming back then said it's really easy. They're like, no, it's not easy. It requires me to think very differently than what I'm used to. I can think imperatively, naturally, because that's what I'm comfortable with. I'm trying to do functional programming, how do I do this? That was really, really hard for me to think functionally. That took a few years to practice. Uh, then, of course, came along uh, reactive programming. And I struggled with reactive programming for a while. And I'm like, what does it mean to be reactive? And I'm all, almost all the documentation that I read talked about how amazing this architecture is. And I'm like, show me the damn code. I want to see how this works. And I, and I like to really see how to write code in that way. And, and it really dawned on me, and it kind of jumped out of me. And, and I realized that functional programming, and I'm sorry, uh, reactive programming, uh, I, I kind of realized is reactive programming is really 
uh, fun uh, you could say it's, uh, it's functional uh, programming plus plus. So it really builds on the abstraction of functional programming. You have a functional pipeline, it's lazy evaluation, and you, you got a better abstraction built on it, so you can build your reactive pipeline much like you build your functional pipeline. That was really a aha moment for me. But in, in spite of all of these things, the one that took me by surprise, honestly, really was asynchronous programming. Because I have spent my entire life almost at that point programming with languages like Java and C++ and Python and what have you. And most of these languages, C++, Java, C Sharp, they give you the parallel libraries. So I'm used to parallel and uh, concurrent programming. My PhD dissertation was related to parallel processing, so I kind of get that. I know what parallel really means. But I've never done asynchronous programming until then. And, and I would stare at a code written in JavaScript and Node, and I'm like, trying to understand what in the world is this really doing? Because I really wanted to understand how things work, not just what to do with them. And it really took me by surprise that wrapping asynchrony around my head was more difficult than I had imagined. And then, of course, I came across Vertex. And Vertex is a library on Java, which provides asynchronous programming, among a lot of other things. And it gave me a sense of doing something like what I do in JavaScript, but on Java. But that was really, really vexing in the beginning to, again, wrap my head around asynchrony. So the question is, what does it really mean to program asynchronously, I think that's one of the first things we need to really understand is because if you don't, we don't understand what asynchrony means, it becomes really hard for us to program asynchronously. So for that, let's talk about what does it mean to be asynchronous? So, so let's talk about uh, asynchronous really is non-blocking. So you want non-blocking request, but what does it really mean by non-blocking? And let's say, you, uh, you want to uh, you know, have a cup of coffee. So you say, hey, could I have a cup of coffee, please? And you request somebody, maybe who's going to make a coffee, or maybe in a coffee shop. Well, what does it mean to be non-blocking? You don't say, could I have some coffee, please, and then start drinking out of a cup. That doesn't make any sense. you got to wait for the coffee to be made. So in general, you could say uh, tasks are always, uh, always, you could say, blocking because you cannot execute a task which requires a response without blocking. If I say, I'd like a cup of coffee, please, I gotta wait for the coffee before I can move forward. If I say I need a data from a remote service, I gotta wait for the data from the remote service. If I want to open a file and read the content, I've gotta wait for the file to come from the content. So I cannot just keep doing stuff without blocking. Tasks are always blocking. However, you, the question is, uh, what does the thread do is the question. Now, here's a way to think about it. We all can agree the first thing we do in the morning when we get to work is we get a cup of coffee before we settle down, isn't it? So you go to the coffee machine and you notice the coffee pot is empty. How, what, how disappointing that is, right? You're not going to be happy seeing an empty coffee pot, right? So what do you do? You turn on the coffee pot and it starts brewing coffee. And I hope you don't do this. You don't stand in front of the coffee machine, look, looking at it, staring at it, and you don't move. Your colleagues come around and say, hey, how are you doing? And you don't respond. You stand like the people at the Buckingham Palace, right? Just staring at the coffee pot, and you're not moving. In fact, your hands are right there to grab the coffee pot when it's ready. I hope you don't do that. That is blocking you, right? But instead, you, uh, you curse a little bit, you turn on the coffee pot, it's brewing coffee, you can hear that pour the fresh coffee into it, you tell yourself, that's okay, the, the, whoever did not put the coffee, refill the coffee, is a bad citizen, but I've got fresh coffee for myself and my colleagues, and so what do you do? You go to your colleague and say, hey, are you ready for talking about the design, uh, ready to meet? And your colleague says, no, I need a few minutes to get ready for it. You're like, okay, no problem. And you go turn on the email, it's downloading this large file. In the meantime, you're reviewing the document you, you really wanted to review. 
So if I ask you, what are you doing? You say, I'm waiting for the stupid, co stupid coffee pot to fill up. I'm waiting for my esteemed colleague to be ready for the meeting. I'm waiting for the email to download. I'm reviewing this document. That is you, the non-blocking you. So you are in the middle of four different things at the same time, you're not blocking and waiting. And when the coffee is ready, obviously you're gonna get a fresh cup of coffee and you're gonna move on. So the question really about non-blocking is not about a task, but a thread. So non-blocking simply means you don't want to block your thread of execution and wait for that to finish. Now, what's the benefit of not blocking your thread? The benefit of not blocking your thread is your thread becomes available to do other things. That's a better utilization of your thread. Rather than the thread saying, I'll just wait around and do nothing while you're waiting as well. So we want to really think about the non-blocking nature. So you want to create non-blocking code. And what that really means is you want your thread to be non-blocking. Your task will have to block and wait to finish the next job, but your thread becomes non-blocking. And so the question is, how do we structure all of this to work on it? So you want to start a thread, but you don't want to block and wait for the operation to be done. But this is the default behavior of the threads when we do this. Now what happens when you write a thread which is going to do some work, but it's going to take the time to do it? Um, imagine you are doing a, developing a UI application. If in the UI application, a user clicks on a button, and if you immediately jump on handling it in the main thread, uh, your main thread is going to be busy handling that request. In the meantime, the user hits a cancel button, or the user tries to exit the application, it won't respond. So there are two reasons why you want to really think about non-blocking. One is responsiveness. If your application thread is stuck on doing something, it cannot be responsive. So if you want it to be responsive, you don't want that thread to be stuck and waiting on it. You want the thread to launch that request and then come back and serve you more requests. That becomes necessary. The second reason for this is, in addition to being responsive, you want it to be preemptable. So you cannot preempt operation if your thread is stuck on doing something. So for preemptability reason, you want that really uh, to be able to break away and provide you ability to work with it. Uh, and then, of course, also performance reasons. So you may want to really improve performance by doing multiple things at the same time. But to me, performance comes after uh, the two other core qualities, right? Uh, responsiveness and interruptibility comes before performance in my mind. So blocking is not generally a good option. So what do we do? We start a thread, first of all, and we say, hey, threads are not really working properly, so we'll create more of them. That's not a really good logic, but that's what we've been doing so far, isn't it? Well, that thread is stuck, so create another thread so that can be stuck. So your thread is no longer stuck. Uh, if you put it in that term, it seems like it's not a great idea. Generally, it's not. So your thread gets stuck, so you spawn a thread, so that thread can be stuck while your thread can keep going. So now we start creating more threads. But the point is that thread is waiting on a response to uh, the remote operation you started, maybe reading a file or accessing data from a database. But when the result comes back, how do we use that particular result? One suggestion for that is to use a callback. So you might be tempted to do something along these lines, right? So you may do something like, you know, do, do work, and, and you could call a function called do work. You can send the data to do work. Maybe this function will, will do it in a separate thread, and then it will give you control really back, so it won't be blocking and waiting. Then you can pass a function to this, right? So response arrow, and then you can provide the function you want to do when the response comes back. So that may, at first thought, look very innocent. You are providing a callback function uh, to that particular function. But what's wrong with uh, using a callback. So if you ever think using a callback is a good idea, I've got a suggestion for you. Maybe you have a friend who programs predominantly in JavaScript. Don't say anything to them yet. Just have a common, normal conversation with them. Don't give them any clue what you're going to do. And then while they're busy doing stuff and enjoying their time, just quietly utter the word callback. And don't say anything after that. 
And after a slight delay, you will begin to see them begin to cry uncontrollably. That's when you know how they truly feel about callbacks. Callbacks are, are a, in fact, they have suffered through this so much, they have a fond name for it. They call it the callback hell. And the reason it's a callback hell is, when you call a function and send a callback, the question is, how do you handle that callback? There's no standard as to whether you get the data first or the error first. There's no standard as to what you do if the callback itself were to fail. And then how do you deal with multiple levels of nested callback? The code becomes horrible and really hard to understand. So most JavaScript programmers have moved away from callback because it's a callback hell. So the developers in the world of JavaScript have learned a few things along the way. And, and I think we can learn from anything and anywhere. So this is something we can learn from them as well. And this is where the concept of promises really come in. So what's a promise? A promise is a really, a, 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 let's think of this as a data structure that is in one of three different uh, states, if you will. So a promise is, is, in the, uh, is in the pending state, or is in the resolved state, or is in the rejected state. So a promise usually is in three different states uh, in general. The, uh, resol the, the, the resolved state and the rejected state really are terminal states. Once a promise enters a resolved or a promise enters a rejected state, it would not change anymore. But when it's in a pending state, it eventually may go into a resolved state or it may go into a pending state. However, it may remain in that state for a very long time, for a, for a you know, unknown amount of time, it might remain in a pending state. Uh, but a pending state is, is supposed to be a transient state, even though it could remain there for a long time. But once it isn't resolved or rejected, it's not going to change. But the way that you build this in JavaScript is you write a function that instead of giving you a response right away, it gives you a promise. And it says, hey, here is a promise for you. And when I'm done with the task, I will update you through the promise by resolving the promise or rejecting the promise. If everything was successful, I'll resolve it. If something was a failure, I'll reject it. So you can know whether you are going through a happy path or you're going through an unhappy path. And you can resolve this pretty nicely in your code based on the situation. So let's take a look at an example just to entertain this thought of how this is actually going to work. So I have a compute function, let's say, and in the compute function, I could simply return n times 2, right? So that's a very simple example here as to how this is going to respond back. So that's my compute function. So, uh, OK, that, not that many times. So here is a compute function. Now I want to print out, let's say, compute and send, oh, let's send a value of 4. And 4 times 2 is 8. So that was pretty wicked, pretty quick, and it responded to us. However, imagine this computation is going to take some time for us to execute. So what am I going to do instead? I'm going to say return new promise right there, right? So I'm going to return a promise, and, and, I, and, I, and I promise eventually we'll get to Java, right? So don't be feared about JavaScript right now. Uh, so just wear your seat belts if you have to. And, and so essentially, in this case, we're returning a promise. And then, of course, what I can do here is I can output from this code the compute and send the four like we did before, and, and we could run this. It says return promise, and the promise uh, you know, resolver undefined in a function, it's complaining for me. So I say function, resolve, and reject. So those are the two states in which we could potentially resolve this particular promise. So here, I'm going to write a, absolutely a silly code here, not that I recommend writing code like this. But what I can do is I can do a set time out, and, and I can ask it to run this for you know, some amount of time. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a minute. And, and what am I going to do? I'm going to take about, oh, let's say a five seconds delay for it to execute. So in this case, it's going to take about five seconds to execute, and then eventually it's going to print out the result for it when, when it's done, right? So that's the promise that it's, it's pending. 
But what I want to do in here though is, at the end of the five seconds, it's going to execute this code, and I could do this. If n is greater than uh, you know, or equal to zero, for example, I could simply say resolve and send n times two. I, I said it's a, going to be a really a terrible example, uh, and, and, and it is, as you can see, right? So then, of course, otherwise, what do I want to do? Else, I'm simply going to say reject it with uh, some error, right? So we can say uh, invalid uh, input, right? Or something like that, that you want to respond and, and communicate that particular intent. And I'll save this a little bit of time here, let's say two seconds delay, and, and execute it. So if I were to run this, notice it says promise pending. The reason it says promise pending is you got a promise on your hand, but the promise has not yet completed. It's not resolved, it's not rejected. So that's why it says promise is pending. But eventually, the promise may resolve or the promise may reject. So what's going to happen if it resolves in this case? You can say then, well, what do you want to do then if it resolves? I can say here is the data I'm getting, and I want to print the data that I get back from that. So I'm going to take this call, and, and to the compute method, I attach a then, and I say then, go ahead and you know, display the result of that data and, and display it. So if I run it, you can see it's an eight. But I can do something else. I can do a then data. I can say data plus one. So eight plus one is nine. After two second delay, I want to see a nine as a response. So you can see how that's working as well. You can again go back to this and say, maybe a data times, let's say in this case, um, uh, data times a uh, four. So nine times four, I can evaluate to a, a value of 36 and print it. So you can see that's going to do the work as well. You can see the pipeline that we built here along the way. And that's nice so far, but what happens if it is not a four, but a minus four? So if it is a minus four, you come into this function, and after a delay, you find that n is not greater than zero, so you're going to reject it with an invalid input. It tells us at this point, a uh, trigger unhandled, uh, uncaught exception error, it's really upset at you because you didn't catch it. What I can do though here is, I can say dot catch, and I can take the error right now, and I can print out, let's say I put the word error in uppercase like so, and then I'm going to say here comes the error that I want to really display. So you could write the code like that, and when I run the code, uh, what, do I, what do I expect this uh, code to do? And I expect the code to be printing the error if it were to fail after the two second. So it says error invalid input. But here comes the charm. You can build the code this way, or I can take this catch from here. I'm gonna drop the catch right there in the middle, as you can see right there, and I'm gonna run the code again. It says, invalid input. But did you notice it says N-A-N? That's the way you can make Indian bread with JavaScript, by the way. That's a pretty amazing feature. So essentially, in this particular case, it still said invalid input. But then why in the world does it say N-A-N? Well, there comes the behavior of how we want to understand how this all works together. And just to alter that behavior, I'm going to show you just one other detail here. So I'm going to put a little curly right here for a minute, and I'm going to print out the response right there uh, so we can see the output of the console right there. But then I'm going to say throw. Uh, this is beyond a reasonable, let's say, repair, right? So I'm going to just blow up with the throw right there from within the catch. Now when I run the code, uh, what, is it, what does it uh, tell me? Of course, I got to write this code properly right there. So what does it tell me now in this particular case when I, when I run the code? So this time around, node, uh, well, okay, I'm trying to get that. The, uh, and and towards the end of this, I'm going to put this one more time. So let's go ahead and say catch. Let's take an error one more time and print out the error right there and, and end the uh, pipeline. So uh, when I run this, what is it going to do? So this is going to uh, fail at the very first catch after reporting the error. 
then it says this is beyond reasonable repair. So with this example, we somewhat have an understanding of what's going to happen. So let's go back and try one more time before talking more about it. So I'm saying a four right there. Run the code. Notice the output. The output is a 36. So what, what happened just now? You went here, right? So this is step one. Let's say happy step one. Then you came here. This is happy step two right there. And this is a happy step three. So those are the three steps you took when you had a four as a result, so uh, uh, as an input. So you had a four, that worked and resolved it. You came to the then, that was a happy step one, and you skipped the catch and you came here, that is happy step two, then you came here happy step three, and then you exited. On the other hand, if you had a minus four, and when you run the code, you can see it specifies that error invalid input and says this is beyond reasonable repair. So what happens now? This becomes an unhappy, uh, you can say, step one. And then this becomes unhappy step two. Did you notice what just happened here? It went from the compute down to this catch block. And from there, it went to this catch block. And just to emphasize this, if I don't put the throw right now, if I remove the throw and run the code, let's see what the output really is. It says error invalid input, and then it said NAN. Well, the NAN comes from here. Just to illustrate it, let's go ahead and say this is the output. I'll just say O uh, with the colon, and then put the output right there. And you can see the O colon NAN. So that's basically proof that it's executing this code. So what happened this time? Well, with the minus 4, that was a rejection. You got into the catch block. The catch block printed the result. And it said, I don't have any complaints. Oh, so you recovered, huh? And then it goes into the then. And whatever it returned from this call, what did it return? It returned undefined because there was no return from this function. Because it gave an undefined, you took undefined times four, and then you tried to print it, and that basically is a, not a number because you took undefined and multiplied with four. So, so you get the idea what's going on. Now, this is fondly called as railway track pattern. That's one of the things we do really well in our field. We'll keep coming up with really beautiful names for things. This is called the railway track pattern. If you understood how that code worked, you understood the railway track pattern. So what does this code actually do? What you're doing here is you have basically a, a, a happy path, if you will, and you have an unhappy path. So you have a data that you send to a, to a function. And once you have a data you're sending to a function, you are then taking that and sending it to a new function, but with a promise. So you have a promise, and then you, that generates a promise, which you send to another function, which generates its own promise, which you send to a function, and it keeps going. So when you have this kind of, a, a, so to say, a railway track, the way this works is you take your data, and then you call the function with it. Now, remember, your promise may be you, you built this pipeline, but once you build the pipeline, your promise may be resolved or rejected. If this promise is resolved, you will work with the data right there in the happy path. So you take this data and you, uh, in the promise and you send it to the next function. And it says, hey, everything is great. So you have a data that you pass around. But maybe this function ends up in trouble. So we'll put a few more here to bring that in. So maybe the next function call ends up in trouble. So as a result, when you program this, uh, when it ends up in trouble, what's going to happen? Well, that threw an error. So you end up with the exception in the unhappy path. So you're down in this bottom row, if you will. What does that do? That sends it to the next function in the, in the chain. But it's going to go to the next catch block when there is an exception. What does that do? It says, you know what? 
this is beyond my ability to fix it. Sorry, you remain in the unhappy path. Maybe the next function says, hey, I can handle it. Now you are back in the happy path. So essentially, your code in the pipeline goes, weaves in and out of the happy path and unhappy path going back and forth. So here's a way to think about it. Let's talk about the current state, uh, let's say. Let's talk about the next state and then the function called. So what's going to happen? Current state is resolved and I have the next state is rejected and rejected. So if the current state is resolved that you are in, uh, in the current state, resolved state, oops, so you're in the resolved state and the next state when you act on the function is going to be a resolved state as well. So you go from happy to happy. So the next function is the next then uh, that is in the pipeline, right? So that's in the pipeline. That's what you're looking for, right? The next then uh, in the pipeline. So that's what is going to execute. Hey, I'm in the resolved state, but I go to the rejected state. Oops, something went wrong. I've just rejected it. What's going to happen? Next catch in the pipeline. So it goes over to the next catch in the pipeline. That's what you saw earlier, right? So you are here in the, in the compute. It failed. What did it do? It skipped the then, and it went directly to the catch block. So, so that's basically the behavior is if you're resolved and the next is rejected, you go to the next catch block. Hey, right now it's rejected, but the next function resolves it. So here I am in the resolved state, right? So I go from the rejected to the resolved state. What's going to happen? Next, in this case, then in the pipeline. It's not going to look for any of the, uh, any more of the uh, catch blocks. You are in the catch block, and the catch says, tell you what, I handled the exception, I recovered it, good job, you're, you're back to normal. Now you're back in the happy path. You can keep moving. You're in the rejected state, and you go back to the rejected state at this point, uh, what happens? Well, then you go to the next catch uh, in the pipeline. So this is basically the behavior of your code in the promises hierarchy. Once you get an understanding of how this works, it's easier to think about the flow through the pipeline in the pipe, uh, promises. Fair enough so far? So, so that's what we saw in the code behavior and, and exactly how that works. That's called your friendly railway track pattern. Well, okay, but why talk about all of this, Venkat? You said this is going to be in Java. You've been talking about promises in JavaScript. Well, the surprise to me was that completable future in Java is really promises in JavaScript. I really wish they had called it promises. I would have learned it in five seconds. Uh, but I spent the time learning completable future, and I'm like, huh? And really, and then eventually, like, oh, they just gave a new name. But I don't blame them, because it's not their uh, you know, speciality, it's our field speciality. Every five years, we'll give a new name for what we already do and get really excited. So that's kind of the nature of what we do, right? Because, hey, why use the name you have when I can give a new name for it? Then it's just novel, right? Really amazing. So that's basically complete future. Complete future in Java is really promises in JavaScript. So you have the stages of the computation that you are dealing with. So in this particular case, those are the stages you are writing that you are working with. So how do we create a completable future and how do we go about using it? So let's take an example here. And, and we'll examine a few interesting things along the way as well uh, as we do this. So let's say I'm going to say here is a compute function which takes some value n. And, and this is a silly example. I'm going to simply return n times 2, let's say. So nothing really exciting. But imagine it is a really time-consuming operation just for our purpose. So I'm going to go back here and say java.util.concurrent.completable uh, future. So in this case, I'm going to bring in a public 
and uh, let's say static, a completable future uh, of integer, let's call it that, is, uh, and we'll call it as create, and, and what am I going to do with the create? That's going to take a number n, and it says return, and we'll say completable future dot, uh, there are two functions you should know about. One is supply async, the other is run async. So if you don't have any work, uh, anything to return, like a statement, fire and forget, then run async is great. Because run async simply says, I don't want any response from you, just do this for me asynchronously, I don't want to block and wait on it. All right, no problem, thank you for asking, I'll go run and finish up and leave. So that's run async. If you want the response back, <coughs> pardon me, as the name alludes to, you say supply async is when you want to really get a response back from it. So in this case, I can say, hey, go ahead and call compute and pass the end to it. So you're essentially giving a supplier to supply async. This is really a supplier, right? So why is it a supplier? Because a consumer, remember, takes an input, doesn't return any response. A function takes an input, returns a response. Uh, a predicate takes an input, returns a Boolean. A supplier doesn't take any input, but can return a response to you. So that's a supplier right there. So that's why it's a supply, because it's a supplier async. So that gives us a completable future uh, in our code right now. So now that we saw the completable, completable future, what do I want to do here? I say output, create, and send a value of four, just like we did on the JavaScript side a few minutes ago, right? So let's go back and run that code and see what it wants to tell us. Notice it says, completable future, not completed. So that means it's in the pending state. So a completable future can be in one of three states, isn't it? The pending state, the resolved state, or the rejected state. So those are the three states, with the resolved and rejected being the terminal states, whereas the uh, pending state not completed is supposed to be the transient state. But who knows how long it's going to run that we don't know in general. Excuse me. So essentially, that's basically the idea we got a completable future. But then what am I going to do here? I'm going to go back to this code, and I'm going to say dot then uh, uh, let's say apply and system dot out print line and I'm going to just print it out. Now I'm sending a four, pardon me, I'm sending a four here and when I send a four, four times two is eight, that's the response I'm going to expect uh, in this particular call. So let's see what's happening. So then apply, uh, pardon me, then accept, I'm sleeping at the wheel, so then accept and I'm going to ask it to uh, print the response, and there's the eight. That's the response we got. So then, once you get the then accept, maybe I want to say a dot then apply, and I want to take the data given to me, return a data plus one, just like we did on the JavaScript side. So when I run the code this time, the result is a nine, as you can see, because four times two is an eight. You take an eight and add one to it, that gives you a nine, which you print it. So that's basically an example of how you are going through this and uh, displaying the value. But there are a few interesting things to observe in this particular case. The very first thing is, it's essentially non-blocking API. So what in the world does it mean by non-blocking? So let's say, uh, we will say, you know, started the computation, right? So started the computation. When I run this code, it says nine and says started the computation. And you may look at this and say, wait a second, it looks like it was blocking. Um, but, but here's the way you want to think about it. Imagine I go to somebody and say, could I have a cup of coffee, please? And then I want to do something. Maybe I want to you know, check on a document. And they may say, sure. And they may take a few minutes to make the coffee, and then they give it to me. Uh, or I say, can I have a cup of coffee, please? And it so happens they just made a fresh cup of coffee. And the minute, even before I could finish the sentence, they're like, here you go. 
And well, it didn't change the fact that they may give me the coffee a little while later, coincidentally, they had it ready for me. So here is a way to think about it. So let's go back here for a minute, and I'm not suggesting you write code like this, but just to uh, get a little bit of a peek into this, if you will. So let's go ahead and put a little code right there, and let's go ahead and say output, let's go ahead and say the thread dot uh, current a uh, thread. And I'm gonna display the thread of execution right in there for us. So right in the middle of that then apply, I'm gonna print the thread and, and return the data. So when I run it, notice it said main thread. And you're like, hmm, what's going on here? Well, the main thread is executing that code and then it's executing this code. Uh, well, wait a minute, Venkat. You said it's non-blocking, but seems like it's blocking. Well, it's important for us to separate the implementation detail from the concept. The beauty is it can figure out what to do. When you call the create function, notice the create called the compute, uh, the supply async called the compute. The compute said, here you go. A uh, number of times two didn't take any, any effort. And it's like, gosh, I finished it and I wanted to move forward, but guess what? I just called to say that the data is ready. So might as well run that data, process the data right away. Notice I am not going to change the code in the bottom. So it says main thread, start uh, the compute computation, and just to kind of entertain the thought, I'm going to say thread.current thread and, and display that as well. So you can clearly see that's in the main thread, obviously, right? So that's in the thread, main thread, this is in the main thread. I'm not going to change the code in the bottom, right? My hands are uh, not going to be in the main function. But in the compute method, I'm going to simply say uh, output, let's say compute called. That's all I'm doing, right? I just introduced a print statement. I'm not sure what's it, what's, what it's going to do, uh, but I'm just curious. I'm going to try with that particular call to see what it does. Now, notice what it is saying here. It says compute called, it's still in main, and it's still in main. So that experiment failed, right? So I, it, I didn't prove what I wanted to prove. That's okay. Uh, failure is not uh, unusual for me. So now, let's go back here and uh, try this one more time. And we will say, uh, you, know what, you know what, maybe we'll print it a couple of more times, how about that? Just to emphasize that, right? But print it a few more times and see what happens. Uh, it still is adamant, I'm gonna run that on, fine. Now let's go, which is good, right? The code is pretty efficient, I, I suppose. Let's do something a little different. I'm gonna come back here and say try thread.sleep, just give a little bit of a time, right? Nothing really great. And uh, let's just give it a little bit of a delay right there to see what it's going to do out of curiosity. And, and let's run the code. So when we run the code this time, uh, what does it say? It says compute called. And notice it says start of the computation main thread. But wait a minute, what happened to this call right here? Well, that did not happen yet, isn't it? So I'm going to just delay this just a little bit so we can actually see the response, not the best way to handle it but let's give it about a two second delay just for us to see the response. Let's run the code now and see what's going to happen. Notice compute called, started the computation of the thread in the main, but the fork join pool is printing the other thread. Once again, just to illustrate the point, if I remove this try, the little delay we added, right? If I remove it, the whole thing is running in the main thread, as you can see. But if I just add that one line of code and run it, we see that we switched over to a different thread that is truly the non-blocking nature that we are seeing here. So in a sense, the call to create is non-blocking. So what does that mean it's non-blocking? Your thread doesn't block and wait. Your thread issues the request and immediately goes to that line of code to execute. In the meantime, that is being executed behind the scenes in a fork join pool thread, and then it executes that code and moves on. It doesn't have to be the fork join pool. 
you can specify the pool you want to use in your code by simply passing that as an argument to the supply async. So you can specify a fork join pool here. It will run in that pool rather than running uh, in, the, in the common uh, pool. So, so that shows us how the uh, code is actually asynchronous. And I hope that gives you an idea how the, uh, this is non-blocking. So if I say, because you are returning a completable future, this is non-blocking, uh, I hope you have a good idea what that really means now. It means that the thread is not blocking and waiting. So what does the thread do? It immediately goes off to do something after that. And in the meantime, when the task is completed, then that part of code is going to be called. And when that's completed, that is going to get called, and you keep moving forward. So that's basically the behavior of a completable future because it's just a promise. So far, so good? All right. Well, a bit of a confusion probably, right? You are like, wait a minute. But what in the world is then apply? What in the world is then accept? Uh, I'm a person who cannot remember a lot of stuff. It's just not me. If you suddenly ask me a question, how do, what, what does that mean? What's the API? What's the function name? I'm like, look, I'm not going to remember what I can Google for. That's just me, right? But I will take the time to remember the semantics because semantics are hard to Google for. You got to know a little bit more to query about a semantic. Syntax, you can always Google for it. And I tend to forget syntax very quickly. So when I look at a then apply or a then accept, it really bothers me. I'm like, what in the world do these method names mean? So let's come back. Let's put a little bit of a method to the madness, if you will, so it becomes easier. Let's talk about the stream API. And let's talk about the completable uh, future API as well uh, in here. So in the stream API, we know that we can use a map. Does anyone remember the type of the argument that map takes? A function, you're absolutely right. A function, if you recollect, right? Uh, do you remember the name of the abstract method in function? Uh, that's called, it's called apply. Now you know why this is called then apply. So then apply is nothing but a map operation. Um, if they called it map, you would have understood it immediately. So they said, no, no, let's make this more interesting. Right? So essentially, it said then apply is map. That's what it really is. And notice what you're doing. You're mapping, right? You're taking a data and returning a different uh, value for it. It's a map operation. So if you think about what does then apply take, function. So it's a map operation. That's what it really is. So, so that's a map. Now remember, you have a for each. Anyone remembers what for each takes as an argument? That's right, consumer, thank you for that. So, and what is the abstract method of consumer? Uh, accept, I'll accept the answer. So right there, and now you know why this is called then accept. So because that's really um, a destination where you're gonna be taking the data but you're not going to return anything. It's a consumer. So then accept is really taking the data. Now, of course, in all fairness, there's a difference here, right? And the difference really is the for each is a terminal operation. We know that, right? For each is a terminal operation. When you, when you call for each, end of story, pipeline is over. But the pipeline for a completable future never terminates. That's one of the nice, beautiful feature of that. So when you run this code in here, you will notice that you get an output, right? Compute called started computation. Let's get rid of that. And let's go ahead and just run this code and see what the output is. So when you run the code, it's going to display the value 9. And I'll get rid of the compute called as well. I don't care about those right now. So you can see that's going to do the job. It's going to display that value, which is a 9, as we can, you can see here. But here comes the charm. Maybe you are going to a, a remote web service or a microservice. 
you got a piece of data asynchronously, and when you got the data, you want to do some work with the data. When you're done the work with the data, maybe you want to store that into a database. So what would you do? This would become you know, data, you could say save to DB, right? And you can take the data. So you can do that in the then accept. So that's great so far. I'm able to take the data and save it. But then you say, yeah, but sometimes, but not all the time, I want to be able to vary this very nicely. I want to do one more operation. I want to maybe do a log, right? I want to log this end of this operation. How do you do that? So you can then come back here and say, then run. And the then run says, I'm not going to take any data, but I'm going to say log some, some info, right? So you can do a logging right there in the end. So when you run the code, it says nine, and then log some info. So this nine comes from uh, this line, and log some info comes from here. You can put another one if you want to. Then run, and you can do you know, some, you can say, post op. So you can run another post op. So the point is, a complete future never really ends. You can keep adding on to it, and on and on and on and on, and at some point, you just run out of the stages. And it says, ah, I don't have anything else to do, right? And it finishes up. So you can keep tagging as much as you want to in here. But, but of course, uh, JavaScript is dynamically typed. So you don't have the type details in the code. It's whatever it is that you send to the function, right? It uses and works with it. Java is, of course, statically typed. So if you have a static typing, what's going to happen? So this is returning. What's the type of the data here is the question. This is completable future of integer, right? Because that's what it is. It's a completable future of integer that you got back. And just for the sake of being excited, let's say dot o right here, just to illustrate the point. That's a 9.0. What is this? This is completable future right there uh, of double, right? So you went from a complete, completable future of integer to a completable future of double. Then you are printing out the result here. So you got a completable future of void. That's what you have right now. Because a consumer doesn't return anything back to you. So this became a completable future of void. And then, as you would imagine, that is a CF of void as well. And finally, that's a CF of void as well. So those are all typed based on the return type of that particular function. So then apply will return a completable future of whatever the type of the return type of the function passed to it is. Then accept will return a complete future of void. Uh, run, then run will work with a complete future of void, return a complete future of void, and so on. So that's basically how that works uh, in this particular case. But we saw the thread of execution. We saw the then accept, then apply, then run. And you can create a pipeline and then connect to it as well. So you can say, I want to build a pipeline of functions, and then I want to call upon it to complete, uh, to, to finish up the operation. You can specify that as well. So this can be really useful uh, to, to, uh, to do a build of a certain operation. So for example, right? let's not look at this one here. Instead, if I go back and say completable future, let's just say of integer, right? So I could say a completable future uh, of integer, and we'll call it as, in this case, uh, a CF is equal to new completable future of integer. So I want to simply return that completable future right in the call. And if you really wanted to, you could just say var over there. And because that's the same type on the other side, less noisy. So we can return the completable future. But then I can say completable future dot, then apply, uh, then apply, and I can take the data, and I could say data times 10 as an example, right? Then apply, and these are the domain-specific methods you can call to do various operations. Maybe data plus one, point, uh, one is good, right? So you can call those functions. So you can build a pipeline, but they can, then you can return the completable future as well. So what's going to happen now is the question. So in here, 
I have a completer future is equal to create, so that gives us a completer future of integer. And what I can do is cf dot complete, and I can ask it to take a particular data that I can pass it and work with it, if you will. So let's see, no arguments uh, to the create. I think it required an argument. I'll just pass that right there. So pardon me. So you can see in this particular case, and again, I'm going to just delay this a little bit because it's asynchronous, non-blocking. Let's just do a, a second of a hold. And uh, you can also put other constructs to hold it. So let's talk about that for a minute. You know, I'm not a fan of calling join or a get on a completable future. Uh, the reason is, uh, I'm, I'm, call me a, a, a perfectionist sometimes. I'm like, I don't want to make the calls that are not good idea in some situations. I then start keep looking at the code. Is it good now, not good now? So typically what I do is I set up some kind of a, a countdown latch and then you know, alert that latch to say that the process is done and you can block the code and move on rather than having to use a, a, a get or a, or a join. Pardon me. So exception in here, I'm just going to give a little delay there to run that code and, and see how it's going to respond to us. And I'm not sure exactly. So this, this is supposed to go over to the um, function here. Uh, uh, create is going to cre create a completed future. And I'm going to then call the completed future and ask it to respond to it. I think I'm chaining this poorly in this particular case. And, and that's the reason why that's failing. I'm going to tweak this a little bit and, and then uh, see if I can get that working. I'll try once, otherwise uh, uh, we'll move on. But, but it's a similar way you can build the pipeline in general. So you can build up a pipeline, if you will, and then you can ask it to perform a, a particular terminal operation on the pipeline where you want to, and you can ask it to go back and execute things uh, in the long run. But I'll leave that aside. But it's just a question of figuring out how to really chain that uh, properly uh, with a few minutes of effort that should be working. But you can create a pipeline and can have things work. But the question is, what do you do when there is an exception? Uh, what happens if things were to fail how do you go about handling that, right? That's a question we want to answer next. So, so the answer for that question really is, when you are performing operations, if something is going to go wrong, let's say we have the value here, if n is less than or equal to 0, I want to simply say, you know, throw new runtime exception, and we will say invalid input, right? So I want to blow up with a little exception right there. So how is this going to respond to if it were to go fail in this particular case? So if I run the code right now, pardon me, you can see that in this case it is saying 9.0 and log some information uh, and then some uh, post up, so that worked really well. But what if I said minus four right there? So notice it didn't produce any output, why? because the railway track pattern, right? It's going towards the next catch, and there is no catch anymore in this code. So that's why it didn't say anything. So what do you do if you want to handle that exception? You can decide where you want to place it, because it's going to go to the nearest catch at that particular point. So maybe I want to say catch over here, and take the exception, uh, and, and maybe I want to simply uh, print the exception, right? So I could say, here is the exception, I want to print it. But the question you want to ask is, what do you do at the end of that particular call? Well, it's going to expect you to return something. So in this case, again, let's say I want to go back to this and say, I want to return, but what am I going to return from here? Well, from here, I want to return, in this case, uh, maybe just uh, maybe 100, right? Just say I want to return 100 if everything was, was good. So in this case, you, you inject this stage, and you're saying, I want to do this. You could, technically speaking, move this to here as well. Because if this were to fail, it'll skip the then and get to the catch. Uh, up to this point, it's good. But they didn't call it catch. Uh, I think they have a very interesting sense of humor. Uh, they call this function as actually exceptionally. And I love this function, by the way, because you know when you would write exceptionally, 
if things really screwed up. So when the boss comes around and says, how's it going? Simply say, exceptionally well, right? And the rest of the programmers know how things are going. The boss will have no clue about it. So, so the point really is, they call it exceptionally. So this is simply a catch block. That's what it really is. So what's going to happen in this particular case? If you were to uh, you know, run this code right here uh, from this particular call, uh, you are saying that when the, let me see what the exception says in this case, uh, error says, invalid bad return type in the lambda, it says, we'll, we'll figure out. So this is simply saying, I have a then act apply, and, and this is taking a piece of data uh, uh, because it's a double, right? So because it's a double, I, I need to specify dot O, that's what it, it was complaining. So now notice, runtime exception, invalid input on 100, and then a sum, a log some info, some post op. So what it really did is it bypassed this value, uh, this then. Why did it bypass? Because the error started here, right? And so it bypassed it. And then it came in here. And this says, don't worry, I recovered from the failure, you're back in the happy path. That's why it went into the print right there as well. But instead of the return, maybe what you want to do is uh, throw new runtime exception, and I'm going to say this is beyond repair, and I'm going to run the code, and notice it says runtime exception invalid input. But just for our purpose, I'm going to say dot uh, uh, exceptionally again, and this time I say take the error and output the error, but then what am I going to return from here? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a void, and if I have something to return, I can return a void. Otherwise, I can throw another exception from here. So you could say, again, I would su suggest not writing this as a curly brace all over, right? That becomes uh, exceptional code. Don't want to do that. So instead, what you want to do is to move them into a separate function, and you want to call them, that's much more civilized, easier to understand, easier to maintain as well. So in this case, I could simply say, uh, you know, throw, and we could say, uh, you know, make, maybe we'll simply say, sorry, uh, we can't do much at all. But when I run the code this time, notice what happened. It said invalid input, and then said this is beyond repair. So what's the sequence? The failure happened here, so it bypassed the then, it went to the exceptionally, it printed the error message. Because it threw an exception again, it bypassed these then run and came directly in here and, and reported. And that's exactly the railway uh, track pattern we saw. So to repeat what I mentioned just to summarize this, so OK, uh, go to the next then. Uh, you know, exception, uh, what do you do? Go to the next exceptionally. The only catch, <laughs> so to use the word, in Java is that it is going to require the proper type handling. So the return type of the exceptionally has to be the proper type, otherwise it's going to mess up. One idea that you can follow is you can write the exception handling code as a generic. And if you write it as a generic, you can plug in in different situations, especially if that function is going to throw an exception, that may give you a bit of a relief. Otherwise, your functions have to deal with the proper return type. It can be a mess to deal with, right? Uh, but of course, if your function is going to return some data, it's got to be specific to the next in the chain, so you got to align to the data type properly. So that's the behavior of the exceptionally, if you will. Now, similarly, when one thing you need to keep in mind is timeout. What if you make an asynchronous call, but the call is not going to finish for a very long time? Well, that's going to be a problem, right? Because you're going to be waiting for that operation to be finishing, and it's not going to finish any time at all. So a timeout is a good idea. So there are two functions available for the timeout. You can say complete on timeout. Hey, if it doesn't finish, I'm going to just finish it with a substitute value. Maybe I cached this previously, I'll use it. Or uh, you can say R timeout, in which case it'll error with a blow up with an exception, a timeout exception. 
And finally, I will mention two functions you can think about. One is a combine and the other is a compose method. These can be really helpful uh, to work with multiple of computations. So for example, here we are taking compute and returning n times two. Let's see how we can make use of that, if you will. So notice what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna say CF1 equal to create, let's say in this case two, and a CF2, let's say, is going to be a, 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 a three. So I got two completable futures with me. But what I wanna do is I wanna combine the results of the two and I wanna move forward. What does the two provide? Two times two is four. What does the three provide? Uh, three times uh, two is six, right? So four and six. And I wanna total them, so the result is gonna be a 10. How do I do that? So I can say completable future one dot, then combine and uh, combine. And I'm gonna say in this case, uh, here is the uh, completable future two that I want to really bring in. So bring in the completable future two. And then what do I wanna do? Take the two data, right? So data one and data two, and I wanna add them data one plus data two. So this is allowing us to combine the results of the two completable future in here. And then dot then accept system dot out and the print line and I can print them out, right? So that allows us to print it in the end when we are done with it. So how does this work? It, it launches off two completable futures to run. When would you use it? If you are writing a Spring application and you want to talk to three web services, and you wanna combine the result of the three web services, this can be really helpful, right? So you can do three asynchronous calls, and then when the three of them respond back, you can combine them back together and you can move forward. So that's the use case where this can be really helpful. So that is your then, uh, then combine. And the last thing I wanna mention here uh, is uh, compose. Now what in the world is a compose? We'll come back to that compose in just a minute. Now. Before we go any further, uh, let's go back to stream API. And the stream API versus, let's say, completable future, we'll come back to this. So I have a function, I call it a one-to-one -one function. You give me an input, I'll give you an output, right? And when you have a one-to-one -one function, I can use a map, and, and what does a map do? It takes a one-to-one -one function and returns as a result a stream of R, right? So that's the response from the map function. But if I have a one to many function, it would give me an input, I'll give you multiple output. If you use a map, you will end up with a, some kind of a collection of stream, which is not desirable, right? So if you really want to use a one to many function, but you want still a stream response, what would you use here? That's right, a flat map, right? Bingo. So in other words, if this function was to return a collection, a flat map is useful. Now let's keep that in mind, and we'll see how this pans out. So I go back here and say, create two dot, then apply, and I'm gonna say over here, in this case, a data, and I'm gonna call create of the data that I get. So two times two is four, but I wanna get a computable future of the four itself. Dot then accept and system dot out print line. So in this case, any guess what the output is going to be of this call? That's right, that's nasty, isn't it? That's a completable future. You're like, no, 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 that's not what I wanted. What I want is, I want this apply to be attached to the completable future that this returns, isn't it? So just like flat map, the equivalent of that in completable future is then compose. So I go back to this code, and rather than then apply, I say then compose. That's what I'm gonna use just like what you saw a second ago. When I run this code, it gave us a completable future when you use then apply. If I change that one line to then compose and run the code, that's an eight. 
So the complete, then compose is the completable future equivalent of the flat map. So you are saying, I don't want you to give me a chain of completable future from here on. I just want to com connect my chain to the other completable futures uh, tail end. So if your function, so here's a way to think about it, right? So if, so if your function, a function returns data, use then uh, apply. Uh, if your function returns a, a completable future, use then compose. So you can compose and go further on the chain and you can process it. So, so that's basically uh, the completable future, and that brings us to the end of the first part. We're going to do a 20-minute break and then continue with the next part right after that. Thank you. All right, let's get started back. I hope you had a good break and ready for the next about an hour and 20 minutes. We will talk about um, virtual threads, continuations, coroutines, and understand what these things mean and how we can benefit, but also why we should use it and what are some of the do's and don'ts. We'll talk about those as well. So to get started, we, are, we looked at an example of uh, the um, completable future and how that can provide us a synchronous call. So just to summarize that part, you can make a, a non-blocking call and your thread can continue processing other things. And when the response comes back from that call, if you're making an IO call, for example, when the response comes back, you can go through the pipeline, you can execute it. But of course, we also saw some of the uh, concerns that could arise from that. The railway track pattern is a um, beautiful pattern in concept. But when you implement it in code, notice what's happening. You have this pipeline. Some parts are thens, some parts are exceptionally. And you got to skip some of the parts and go to the exceptionally. That is a cognitive load, isn't it? It challenges your mind. You got to sit there and think about it. Some of the other problems you're going to run into is, uh, with the exceptionally, should I throw an exception or should I return a result? Uh, what should the return type be? Well, that depends on the where you put in the pipeline. If you change the type along the pipeline, the exceptionally may break. You have to rewire those types as well. That can become really hard. The more long, the longer this pipeline is with the multiple levels of exception, the harder it becomes really to manage the code, maintain the code as well. That can become really, really hard. Uh, but let's take a pause from that. Let's take a look at a different approach here. If you are using Java 8 or Java 9 or anything before Java 20, 21, depending on how you look at it, uh, completable, future, completable future is an option you have available. Um, and I have a number of clients that I work with who have used completable future quite heavily. And, and a lot of companies have used this approach, so this is not a solution that is uh, so unusual. But in general, when I talk to them, I say, how do you feel about using completable future? Uh, their answer is, uh, it's okay, right? Or, you know, it, it, it uh, is, is okay, but there are times when it, we find it really hard. So it can be difficult to be able to use things like completable future uh, life can become a bit more difficult, even though it has this nice functional pipeline built into it. Now let's deviate from the topic. If you're using Java 20 or 21, uh, 21 more specifically, you have access to virtual threads. And I am going to say that virtual threads are uh, going to make a huge difference in the Java ecosystem. Um, I, back in time, I used to say that Java 8 was the most important release of Java. Uh, now I'm going to say Java 21 is the most important release of Java so far. And the reason is virtual threads. So why, why would it be really the case? Because if you really think about threads, what do threads really do? 
threads really, you spawn a thread, but if you call a method, it blocks on that method. Uh, let's take an analogy and think about it. Uh, uh, let's say you have a restaurant you go to to have a meal, and you sit down with a group of friends at a table, and the waiter comes around and says, what would you like to drink? And you say, what do you have that, that, that uh, is exciting to drink? And the waiter says, well, let me give you a list of things we have available, and, and says a few things. And then you say, hmm, I'm not really sure what I would like to drink. Um, t can you tell me a little bit more about what would be exciting to drink? And the waiter pulls a chair, sits next to you, and says, let's talk about it. Well, that's not going to be a good restaurant, isn't it? Because the rest of the table, people are starving, and uh, they want a refill of their water, and the waiter completely ignores this other table. Uh, most likely, this restaurant would go out of business if you have waiters who drag the chair and sit down, isn't it? But what does a good waiter in a good restaurant say? Uh, tells you what's available and says, why don't you keep thinking about it? I'll be right back, and slips away. And the waiter goes around, serves other tables, and comes back to check on you and say, how's it going? Are you ready to order? What would you like to drink? Uh, and provides a little bit of information that you may need, and then goes away. You are in the middle of your meal, and as you are having food, maybe your water, uh, water um, uh, cup is close to being empty, what happens? A restaurant who is, a, 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 a waiter who is walking by uh, with a jar of water finds that your glass is almost empty and pours the water, isn't it? I hope in the cup, because to me in one restaurant, the waiter was eager to pour the water and pour it on me. And the worst part was, I was in a very important client meeting. So I was with all these business people, soaking wet like I took a shower. I'm like, excuse me, I have to go. So this was not a fun experience. But a good waiter pours in the, in the, in the, in the cup, isn't it? So essentially, uh, you don't say, excuse me, stop. You can't put water in this cup. You're not the waiter assigned to me, go away. That's the best way to get kicked out of the restaurant, right? You don't care which waiter gives you water as long as you have, you have, you're given water, isn't it? So the idea is, you, if you think of the analogy of um, a waiter in a restaurant to a thread, you don't want the waiter to block and wait on a table. Similarly, you don't want a thread to block and wait on a task because that's not a good use of a resource. So what, what can we do? This is where we want to be able to switch between different, uh, uh, threads should be able to switch between uh, tasks. So in the past, we were running task, and if a task needed some more time to run, you block the task and the thread at the same time. So in other words, when the task is blocking, the thread is blocking. That is kind of like those of us, those of you who have very young children, uh, probably remember it. My children were young once upon a time, not anymore. But if you have really small children, maybe toddlers, maybe even infants, as a parent, what's one thing you realize very quickly? When the child wants to take a nap or child sleeps, you don't say, that's great, I'm going to just sleep when the child is sleeping. No work ever gets done. So as a smart parent, you say, whew, the child is finally sleeping, let me get my work done in the meantime, right? And the threats have to be smart like that, like that parent. You used to say, the task is sleeping because it's waiting for a result to come back, I'm going to go do other things. So this is where a few interesting concepts come in. I'm going to illustrate this concept in Kotlin for a few minutes, only because it becomes easy to see the uh, model really nicely here. But then we'll come back and work on this in Java and see how that works. But when it comes to threads, first is a subroutine. So what's a subroutine? A subroutine is just a function. You call a function, it gives you a response, it's a, sub, a subroutine. So you call a function, functions normally don't remember state. You send an input, it gives you an output, end of story. A coroutine, as the name alludes to, cooperating routines. So a coroutine cooperates between the two. So you can think about it as something like this. You can think about it as you have a routine one, let's say, in here, 
and you have a routine too that you have uh, you know right there but when you make a call to one of your routines right here this goes ahead and makes a call to this other routine that's that's over here and now that you made a call to this other routine this routine is not completed in the case of a subroutine this will complete in the end right so when it finishes you will get a response from it back here so this is the kind of the kind of the programming model that we often use so you make a call to your function that makes a call to this other function that runs for a while returns a response and then you can continue doing your work after that but instead of doing so there's still one function right uh, in in the left and one function on the right you make a call to this function but this function returns a response to you right in the middle of the call or at least yields to you you can then do some more work and then when you are done with that work you can go back and make a call uh, to that same function but to continue from where you left off so in this case this is essentially uh, what you are doing is you're saying i'm not finished with my work but i'm just going to take a pause and then get called one more time and then it can do some more work here and then you respond back this could potentially come back over here and continue with the call again and you just resume that call and you keep moving forward so that becomes a cooperating routine so you can kind of weave in and weave out of functions that's basically what a concept of coroutines give you by the way the co concepts like coroutine have been around for uh, several decades uh, if you really ask me honestly i would say this is one of the things i'm the most happy with when i was a, a you know a student when i was a young kid uh, a, a student of computer science uh, honestly i would be curious about these concepts in computer science i would go get these books and i would spend the hot summer days hiding away from heat reading these books and i remember several days i would read about a concept and then i would be looking out the window thinking wouldn't it be so cool to be able to try these ideas out but i but i couldn't because those were available in some esoteric languages and and you had to be part of a certain group if you want to have those access to those languages so these were only concepts i could read and and fast forward 35 years later i'll tell you uh, what i'm excited about is that my children and and the next younger generations uh, can use these concepts with almost no cost uh, this is truly the democratization of the technology so if you ask me tell one thing that happened in 40 years i'll tell you that to me is is the amazing thing in our field is the democratization of technology anybody who wants to get into the technology can get in at a much lower cost and lower resistance than it used to be back in time so that's pretty rewarding so all these concepts have been around for several decades but they are definitely moving into mainstream languages uh, you know quite in, in interesting ways so to understand this let's take an example and play with it and then we'll come back to this so so let's say we want to think about how this actually works so i'm going to use a little example in in kotlin uh, just to see how this actually works and and see uh, the benefit of this idea of coroutines and and then a few other things uh, but also to be able to see this idea of asynchronous programming remember you want non blocking thread that's what you're trying to really get so i'm going to write a function here let's say fun and we'll call it as task 1 Oh by the way I just want to mention one thing Kotlin is a beautiful language I really really like it but not only is the Kotlin is a great language the developers behind the language also really care about humanity so they want you to not just write code but they want you to have fun when you write code that's why they call it fun right so fun task 1 you feel the new energy when you write the code right so so that's amazing isn't it so so here is a task 1 and i'm going to print out here i'm going to say in uh, so we'll call it as entering task 1 that's what i'm going to say here and and i will also mention right here 
a thread, let's say a thread dot current thread. So we can see what thread is going to uh, execute it, right? So, so we'll take a look at the output as well. Similarly, I'm going to say exiting uh, task one so we can see which uh, is executing that as well. Uh, so that's my first uh, you know, uh, little code. But I'm going to take this one, and I'm going to write this one here as this is task one, but I'm going to say this is task two. So then we will call a run function, and I'm going to say task one and a task two, and then I'm going to simply print out, let's go ahead and say uh, called the tasks, and we will simply output thread dot current thread, so we can take a look at the output of that as well from right there. So, so far so good, right? So we got this method we are interested in uh, calling, and we want to know what this code is going to do. And you can pretty much see that's a, like, kind of a boring example in this particular case. I'll fix that error in just a minute. So essentially, what we are doing here is we are asking it to evaluate uh, task one, entering task one. And then it says the thread.current thread, whatever thread is executing, task two. Similarly, thread.current thread, and then we are exiting from it. We're running task one, running task two, and we want to display basically the uh, thread of execution here to say which one is executing this particular code. So let's see what did I do wrong here. So it says current thread. Did I make a mistake in spelling that? Uh, oh, R is missing. Let's go ahead and fix it. So uh, let me actually seek your help. Which line number did I mess up? In all of them. Hey, I was consistent at least, right? So, so that is good. So current thread. Is that what the problem was? All right, thank you. You just restored faith in pair programming for me. Thank you. This is right. So if anybody says pair programming doesn't work, take it, right? It does. So in fact, mob programming, right? Even better. Oh, did I mess up again? Last line. Oh, yeah. OK, thank you. So excellent. Wonderful. So uh, awesome. That shows that you are awake and I'm sleeping. That's good. So everything is running in main, as you would imagine, right? So that's a boring example. You know, printed one, printed two, and then call the task. That's the output you are seeing. OK, so we saw that output. But I'm going to change it to run uh, a blocking. So in this case, why, why do we call it run blocking? We'll see that in a minute. So let's import, you know, Kotlin, let's say, x dot coroutines um, dot star. So essentially, in this case, run blocking simply calls a parent coroutine and, and tells the parent coroutine, go run, but don't finish until the children are finished as well. That's Kotlin's way of doing structured concurrency, which is different from Java's way. But in this case, it's saying, wait until that is over before you finish and move forward. So far, so good. But then I'm going to say launch right there. And I'm going to say launch right there as well. Launch simply says, I'm going to be non-blocking. I want to run task one, but I'm not going to wait for it. Fire up and keep moving. Fire up and keep moving. And print out call the tasks. So now it's flipped, as you can see. So it's going to say called the task first. Then it ran task one. Then it ran task two. So far, so good, right? But all that in main. However, when you call the uh, task one, it's pending, it's waiting in a hypothetical queue, if you will. And then task two is waiting in a queue. You print this, you come to the end. Well, I can't leave until my children have completed, but it's going to go run a child, run another child, and now that everything is over, it finishes and moves forward, right? So that's basically the result you saw. But while in the middle of execution of task one, what if I'm going to take a little longer to do task one, let's say. So notice in this case, we entered one, exited one, entered two, exited two. But right in the middle of task one, if you say delay, let's say uh, 1,000. Similarly, here I say delay 1,000. So I'm just artificially introducing a delay in execution. So delay task one, delay task two. Now in this particular case, uh, you want to say that this is, should be non-blocking. So when delay is called, don't just wait and watch that delay. When, when your task is delayed, you don't want your thread to be delayed. That's a, such a waste of resources, isn't it? So imagine you have a thread running, you have a task running, and the task says, hey, I want to sleep for a second. 
The third says, great idea, let's sleep together, right? This is not a fun experience, right? Because what happens? The rest of the system is like, hey, we got work to do, where's that thread? Oh, it's busy waiting. Uh, I won't mention the name of the organization here, but this is within the US government. I, I walk in, because I'm a consultant, I walk in and they said, uh, the gentleman said, you are being assigned to me and I am responsible for you. And I said, that's great, thank you. And he was not like that happy to hear the thank you. And he stayed with me the entire day. When I mean entire day, the entire day. He never left anywhere. I said, I need to go to the bathroom. He said, let's go. <laughs> this was the mo most awkward situation because as a consultant, you're not allowed to walk around in a secure facility, right? And he was not kidding when he said that. He came to me in the bathroom. So, but I was thinking, my taxpayer money is being spent on this guy babysitting me the entire day, right? That's kind of what the threads do. The thread says, thank you for coming. You are with me for the entire journey. From the beginning to the end, it's gonna do that, right? Not a good use of the thread. Now, we wanna tell that this is a function is a non-blocking function. Now, I got an official complaint to make here. It would be nice to use nice words. They use fun, I'm very happy. I would have been happier if they said non-blocking fun. That would have been really nice. So I was talking about this a few days ago and somebody said, no, I want it to be non-stopping fun. That's even better. <laughs> but I'm really sad. This is one request I'm gonna to make to them to change the keyword. They call it suspend fun. How terrible that is, right? I think they should have thought about it, right? Suspend fun. But that's basically, this is one of the things about uh, Kotlin is that you annotate the function if it's a non-blocking function. I wish Java had this, but, but Java decided to go a different route and you don't annotate functions for this. So this really makes it harder to know which functions support blocking versus non-blocking calls. But in this case, we said suspend, and when I run the code, notice what the output actually tells us. It says, call the task thread main, entering task one, but notice the very immediate call after that. It says entering task two, and then it says exiting task one, and then exiting task two. So if you are in the third line, next to the third line, if you ask the question, where is the main? Well, the main is in multiple places right now. The main is in the run blocking, the main is in task one, and the main is in task two. So that illustrates the true non-blocking nature. It, it, it started the coffee pot, it started talking to the colleague, it started downloading the email, so it's in the middle of all of these, it's non-blocking. So the thread is not blocking. The tasks are blocking, but the thread is not blocking. So, so in other words, we were able to jump in here, we executed this code right there, then we jumped in, ran that code, then we came in, ran that code, then we went in and ran, ran that code in the middle of that code, and then we jumped into the middle of this and ran it, and then exited it. So that shows a true non-blocking nature of the, of the thread. And that brings us to one other concept, which is the concept of continuations. So what are continuations? Before we talk about continuations, let's go back to this code for a second. Now, I am here, and I'm gonna say val, uh, you know, let's say stuff is equal to, let's say 10, but I'm gonna print out the value right here of the stuff. So if I run the code, you can see that in this case, it's gonna print out the value of that stuff, even, it's essentially, right, pardon me. So it's gonna be printing out the value of that eventually in this particular case. I wanna print out the uh, stuff. So, so essentially, right here, we can, we can see this is going to be whatever the value is of that particular, of that particular uh, variable, I want it to be printed here, isn't it? So when you, when you run the code, you can see the value 10. But the point is, remember you left and came back right here. But when you left and came back, 
it is still able to remember the details of the state from before this particular call. So how can it restore the state and how can it move forward is a question that might intrigue us. So this is where continu continuations come in. So what is a continuation? Continuation is really, you can say it is a data structure, basically that's what it is, structure, um, that uh, helps to restore uh, the context of a call between uh, calls to a coroutine. So essentially, when you go back and forth between a coroutine calls, it's able to remember the state of the call and restore the state and move forward. But I would say there are a few things about continuations. Uh, so continuations uh, you know, should be a data, uh, a data structure that you, let's say, benefit from, uh, uh, benefit from, but should not have direct access to it. This is something very important to think about. What if you manage continuation yourself? I'll tell you clearly you don't want me to do that because I'm going to mess up. I'm going to create more bugs in code than any human can fix it. And it's going to be horrible. My state is going to be messed up or not loaded properly. It's going to be terrible. So while continuations are really, really important, you want that to be in the background. You want to know it is there, but you never want to touch it because that's going to mess it up. So the continuations in Java are completely behind the scenes. You're not going to use continuations directly, but know that it's there. It's a concept you want to benefit from, but not have to program it because that should be taken care for you. Just to think about it, illustrate it, uh, I'll just say how this is actually being done just to kind of you know, benefit or, or appreciate the idea. So if I create a function, let's say, a compute which takes an integer and simply returns an integer, right? Just a regular function, nothing really exciting uh, in here. So, so when you look at this particular uh, function, oops, uh, when you look at this particular function, you will notice just a regular function, nothing really exciting. Let's go ahead and say Kotlin C-JVM and, and sample.kts. I'm going to use Java P to take a look at the uh, sample dot, uh, you know, class and take a look at the bytecode it produces. And, and what do I know about this particular bytecode? It is compiled from the Kotlin code, but here's what I can tell you about this. Here is the compute method, as you can see, and the compute takes an integer, returns an integer, it's a final method. So nothing really you know, exciting than what you might have expected. However, if I go back to this code, and I'm gonna say this is, uh, let's say, compute2. So this compute2 has been marked as suspend, right? That's the only difference between the two functions. One is suspendable, the other one is not, except for that little two I added. But I'm gonna compile this code one more time, take a look at Java P to take a look at the bytecode generated. What you notice is the compute is still the same. But if you look at the compute2, notice that has a continuation that was baked in by the compiler. So the compiler knows that this function is a suspendable function and provides a support in the background so you don't have to code that. So you get the benefit of it without the, you know, a t a, 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 the effort or without messing it up uh, by doing the wrong things. So that, that really comes into play uh, really nicely. So we talked about some of the concepts here. Time to move on to understand how we can benefit from these uh, in the case of Java. So let's go ahead and try uh, a slightly different example here. But before we jump on to the concept of um, uh, virtual threads, let's try something a little bit different. Let's go back to the Java code and let's talk about threads really quickly. So I have a function I want to call with a thread. So let's create something really, really simple. So I'm going to say max equal to 100. And, and because I have a max, some small value, so I'm going to say for, let's go ahead and say uh, i equal to 0, 
i less than max i plus plus and in this case i will say new a thread and a sample let's simply call as a do work and do a start on it so i started the thread and when i'm done i'm going to say try let's say a thread dot sleep uh, let me try this again so thread um, so thread dot sleep and let's give it oh let's say a five second delay right so and then a catch exception so we'll just delay this and wait for this and then i'm going to simply say uh, done right so yep i finished it it was able to start it what does the do work function do so public static let's go ahead and say do work and the do work doesn't do any work right it simply says i'm going to sleep for oh let's say uh, five seconds so this is going to sleep for five seconds and then be done with it but what's the catch the catch is when you call this on a thread that thread is going to block and wait for five seconds when a th task is blocked the thread is blocked isn't it that's a behavior unfortunately so as a result what's going to happen in this particular code if i run this you can see that it takes about five seconds and eventually it says done so that was not a problem but if i just want to run this here on the command line so we can see that it's going to say done that's not a big deal five seconds later it says done right so no big deal but what if i were to in fact let's even reduce this because just say three seconds that should be enough for me to illustrate this point what if i create a thousand threads in this case well if i have a thousand threads that's going to start all those thousand threads are going to be waiting if you were to monitor the number of threads your system is using you will literally see it uses more than thousand threads but the good news is it worked right it ran it finished it it said done so no big deal but what if i ask it to do a 5000 threads well it depends on the amount of memory i have in my machine as it turns out i do have enough memory to create a, a 5000 threads that worked what if i say 10000 threads so if i write it to run 10000 threads what you notice over here is it blew up saying out of memory error. So it just couldn't handle it. But the irony is, what did the code do? Uh, really nothing. It was just sleeping. But when, when a task said, I want to sleep, the thread is, oh, I love that, right? And the thread ends up sleeping while the task is sleeping. So if you turn up the volume, you can imagine the amount of snoring you're going to hear from this particular process, right? So all these thousand threads sleeping all at once, or 10,000 couldn't create them. So that's not very elegant. That's not very efficient. But the question you want to ask is, when a thread sleeps, sorry, when a task sleeps, do you want the thread to sleep? That's a question you want to ask. Does it make sense for a thread to sleep when a task is sleeping? So let's try this a little differently. Let's go back to a modest value of uh, 10. Let's uh, start with that. So we know that that's not going to be a problem, right? So it's going to work. The threads are going to work for a value of 10. But let's go back to this code. And instead of a thread, let's go ahead and say thread dot, and let's say start virtual, uh, virtual thread. And, and obviously you started it, so there's no point in calling start again. So we are calling start virtual thread. So this says, hey, go ahead and fire up a virtual thread, not a real thread, and go ahead and call that method. What do virtual threads do? A couple of things to understand. First of all, virtual threads are super lightweight. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Why is super lightweight? Well, because the word lightweight was taken already. And, and because threads are lightweight, they only can have super lightweight, right? So th uh, virtual threads are super lightweight. They are managed by the JVM and not by the operating system. There are courier threads that are created for you, and there are these courier threads are a lot fewer in your application. And a virtual thread gets mounted onto your courier thread. And when there's work to do, you have a career thread and a virtual thread is mounted on it. And it executes the code. But when the task blocks, the virtual thread gets unmounted from the uh, career thread. 
So you are saying, hey, let the task run. When the task is blocked, we don't want to block the underlying thread. So the courier thread, we're going to unmount from it when a blocking operation happens. When the operation is ready to run, we will remount it on a courier thread, not the same courier thread, on a courier thread, and we will execute moving forward. So when you look at this particular code, you are starting the virtual thread. It starts executing. If you have code here that's going to run the code in the courier thread, the minute it hits the sleep, it's going to unmount it. So there's no more thread being used at the operating system level. It's going to wait for the duration. When it finishes, it'll get remounted, and it can run any code after that. So at this point, an unmount is happening. And at this point, a mount is happening before that code is actually executed. So you can think about it like this, right? So there's an unmount that happens right there. And then there's a mount that happens right there when you come back to it from the sleep itself. So that's basically the idea of mounting and unmounting. Now, keep in mind, uh, mounting and unmounting is going to take some time. So if you're asking, can I have something with absolutely no overhead? And you know the answer for that already, right? Uh, no overhead doesn't give you any solution. There's going to be overhead always. But the question you want to do is to compare. Would I rather block the thread and wait for the duration? Or would I incur the overhead and perform the context switching? And if you find that it's, it's much better to do the context switching uh, compared to the time you spend waiting on the operation, then this might be very beneficial, and often it is. So, so the thread is going to unmount, and the thread is going to get mounted back again at the end of this. So when you, when you run the code right now, it, it's going to say done. Obviously, that's not a problem. But what if I said, uh, really, at 10,000 threads? Remember, it couldn't run with 10,000 threads. So I push it to 10,000 threads right now. And I say, run that for me. And it says, uh, you gave me 10,000 threads. I'm done. Not a problem. You can say, really? Try 50,000 threads for me, right? And you run 50,000 threads. It says, why don't you give me something more challenging, right? So it doesn't have any problems with it. What if you tried 100,000 threads? Do you feel your pulse rate is going up a little bit, right? That's 100,000 threads. And guess what? All these 100,000 threads meet the sleep, and they get unmounted. So you don't have much of a, a thread you are using in the system. I've run some profilers. And before I switch over to virtual thread, I'd be using thousands of threads. Once I turn on virtual thread, that shrinks down to a much smaller number of threads I use at the operating system level. So you can go back here and say, hey, what if I want a million threads, right? That's one million threads. That, that feels uh, quite um, you know, scary, isn't it? So you're saying, give me one million threads. And, and it's like, I told you, give me something more challenging. So essentially, it has no problem dealing with it. Why? Because virtual threads occupy very small amount of memory. Will you ever run out of memory? I think you'll have other problems before you get to that point. So, so that is not going to be the concern most of the time. But what is the benefit of doing this? The benefit of this is, imagine this for a minute. You have an application that is receiving some, oh, let's take an example uh, to understand what the benefit of this is. I'll take an example of a, a hotel. So you go to the hotel, and it's a late night flight. You're dragging yourself to the hotel. You're tired. You want to check in. So you're, you come to the front desk, and you're standing there, and you see there are two people in the front desk. And there is one person in front of each of the person. And they are talking to this person. And you're like, oh, I've got a long flight. I'm tired. I want to go to my room. And, and this person is asking uh, for something. And the, and the person at the desk says, uh, can I have your ID, please? And says, let me make a photocopy of this ID. And goes over, puts it on the machine, presses a button. And you can hear this. Ding! 
and you're like, please kill me now, right? It doesn't really feel exciting, and you're like, why can't they be efficient? Well, what would a really efficient person of the front desk do? They say, can I have your ID, please? They put that for a, you know, copying. While it's beginning to copy, they say, would you mind please step aside? Let me help this person real quick. And they can turn around and help other people, put them on hold, and get back to them because they can't do anything until the copying is done, for example. So the point is, you want the thread to switch between tasks rather than being blocked. Now let's take a, 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 a you know, scenario uh, of where this can help us. So imagine for a minute that we are in a, a Spring Boot application, or you are in any web uh, server which has to process the request. So a request comes in, and for our purpose, let's take an insanely simple uh, example to understand what this means. So let's say your system only has two threads that you have available, right? It's a rather unrealistic situation, but it helps, it helps to understand the problem. So you got two threads. So what's going to happen? Since you have only two threads available to serve, the request R1 comes in. When the request R1 comes in, what does the threads do? There is a thread that is given to handle it. So here is your thread T1. And what does the thread T1 do? It does some work within your controllers, within your services, and then make a remote, a remote call and block. So your thread T1 makes a remote call and blocks it. Why? Hey, I'm in my controller, I call my service. Hey, I'm in a service, I need to make a call to this remote server to get the data I want, so poof, I go make a call. Well, your call is pending, your thread is waiting. In the exact same time, you are receiving another request, R2. And the second request comes in, what do you do? Oh, no problem. We will immediately assign thread T2, right? And the thread T2 will serve the second request. So what are we going to do in here? Well, make remote call uh, and block, right? That's what we're going to do. Now, they both are waiting. In that time, you have a request R3 that comes in. What do you do with the request R3 at that time? Uh, tough luck. You can't handle it, right? So you're going to block this request and say, you got to wait, wait for your turn. So you be in the queue waiting. In the meantime, you got three more requests coming in. You have R3, you have R4, and you have R5, and all of them are just pending and waiting because they cannot be served. Now let's rethink about this scenario, if you will. You are in the same situation. You have request R1 coming in. T1 does the processing. The controller does the job. The service does the job and says, I need to make a call to this remote service. And the minute you make the call to remote service, make remote call and unmount. So you unmount from the thread as soon as you make a remote call. And you say, go away, do this work for me, I've unmounted my thread. So similarly, the thread uh, request two comes in and it says make remote call and unmount. So now T1 and T2 are available. Uh, why are they available? Uh, because you have made a request, you unmounted from those threads, and they can be used for other purposes. Now what's going to happen? Well, R3 and R4 come in. They don't have to block and wait. They can be served immediately. So this could be uh, served by, let's say, T1, and this could be served by T2. So they both could be served instantaneously. But then when they make an I.O. call, you will again unmount which means the threats return back to the front to keep serving and can go back and work on these repeatedly without you having to uh, you know, block and wait for much a long time. So what's the benefit? The first benefit is you have a much bigger throughput. The second benefit is you need fewer threads on your server to serve the same amount of requests you had before. What did you do in the past? You are supporting a number of threads, and you are looking in production. Hey, the calls are taking longer to serve. The requests are taking longer to serve. What do you tell your boss? You tell your boss, boss, I have a problem here. 
the throughput is not great because we are maxing out on the thread. And if we put more threads on this, we are not able to uh, get a better performance. Why not? Because there's only so much memory I have. But it's not just the memory, right? It is also the number of cores on the machine that's going to make a difference. If you have a number of cores, right? Number of cores is, let's say, number C. How many threads can you go up to? The number of threads you can have, there is a little formula you want to think about, is, 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 uh, is equal to number of cores. So number of cores, first of all, divided by uh, what is called the one minus the blocking factor. So where a blocking factor is zero less than or equal to the blocking, blocking factor, uh, which is less than uh, one. So where it is the fraction of time a thread waits on, uh, you know, uh, on I/O or blocking calls. So where it's not using the CPU. So essentially, in this case, this is a little formula that determines the number of threads you can have. So even if you have a, a task, if your task blocks for 50% of the time, the number of threads is less than or equal to twice the number of cores, right? Uh, so twice the number of cores. So that's kind of drastic, isn't it? If you have a thousand cores, you can go up to 2,000 threads if your threads block for half the time. That's not a whole lot. So what do you do eventually? Your bosses talk to their bosses when they're playing golf, and they sign up a contract because they need elastic services, and now the cloud computing systems get deployed to spin more processes. We screw the environment in the meantime and keep sending bigger checks to these companies. So why? Because threads like sleeping. And that's kind of sad, isn't it? Why should threads sleep rather than actually getting work done? No restaurant would have ever survived if the waiters were like the threads, right? Because they're like, where's all the waiters? Oh, they're busy helping customers. Well, what are they doing so long? Oh, they just pull the chair. They're sitting there and talking. Uh, they want to make sure the customer is really happy. Well, that's not the way to make customers happy, right? So that's the key. What's your utilization? That's not going to work really well. So the, so the model of the story here is you want to be able to switch between them. You want to unmount and you want to remount. So, so that's basically the behavior of this code and how that actually is working. So with that said, you, I want to show you one more example of this to see how you can you know, move your programming model forward. What I really like about this is you don't have to change a lot of code to reap this benefit. So with little change to the code, you can get a huge benefit in terms of the scalability of your application. So what this means is you can be on similar machines that you normally do, but you can support a lot more uh, a task of execution, and, and so your scale is much better. You're, you have higher scale with smaller uh, you know, uh, needs, demands on your system, so, so that's a good thing. Uh, let's talk about two more things. I want to talk about how this can be used in a, uh, in a uh, you know, programming uh, situation where we want to perform a task and how we can bring that together. And then I want to talk about you know, where to use it and where not to use it. And then we'll wrap up with a quick discussion of the programming model after that. So let's talk about something here. I want to take a little example and play with it. So here, let's say, I'm going to say public, let's say static. Uh, let's call it as a fetch, where I send a path to it that I want to fetch from. And what am I going to say here? I'm going to say file.lines, a path, path, let's say, dot get path. And we'll say the lines uh, count. So this gives me the number of lines in a file. And I'm going to say this is the uh, you know, number of lines, right? So number of lines. And I'm going to simply print out the number of lines. And I'm going to output number of lines. So that's all I'm doing in the fetch function. So nothing really exciting. So let's bring in java.nio. Uh, what do you call this? File uh, uh, dot. 
and this is a file dot, and this is going to be the uh, files, right? So we'll, we'll ask you to read the files. But as you know, when you read the files, you may have to deal with exceptions. So what are we going to do for the exception? I put a try block right there. I put a little catch block. And if there was an exception, we will handle it. So exception, we'll say this is an IO exception, right? So IO exception. And uh, if there's an exception, we're going to handle it. So I'm just going to say exception for now. And whatever the exception, you know, you can handle it the way you want to handle it. So we could simply say output, uh, maybe an exception, and tell that something went wrong. So output, let's say exception dot get message, right? So just print it out for now. So, so given this, uh, we're going to print out the number of lines of code, but I'm going to take this number of lines of code and move it up here as well, so we can see that being printed. So far, so good. Now, just to make it a bit more easier, let's put an index over here, comma, and let's go ahead and output the index, if you will, plus, let's say, thread dot current thread. So I want to display the thread of execution uh, that goes to the code. So index and the thread of execution, right? So similarly, I'm going to come down here and say number of lines is going to be the value there plus number of lines. So that way you can see that in one line. So you have the pre, you have the post, right? So uh, we will even say this is going to be a before and this is going to be and after, right? So we'll say this is after. There we go. So that's good, right? That's good enough for our purpose. So that's our class so far, code so far. And in this particular case, uh, it's a, a var, not a val. So there you go. Uh, so that's our uh, code that we have so far, and we want to make use of it. Great. So um, now, uh, paths.get, did I do paths? Let's do that really quickly. And uh, the count. OK, so far so good. How do we use this? So we are used to using executor services, right? So maybe you want to make multiple calls to these services. In this case, it's reading a file, but I want to make calls to it. So what I can do here is I can say, first of all, let's bring in java.util.concurrent.star. And in this case, I'm going to say, hey, let's bring in an executors. Uh, executors uh, is equal to. Uh, executors, uh, this is going to be executor service, is equal to executors dot new, let's say fixed, uh, we'll say fixed thread pool, oh, let's simply say uh, a 10. So I created a pool of 10 threads, right? That's all I did. Uh, I could even say max equal to, uh, max equal to 10, and simply use that thread right in here, right? So max. There we go. So we created the threads. What's the next step? I'm going to say executor service dot. I'm a big fan of shutting it down. So shut down. And executor service dot await, um, let's say await a termination. And let's provide a 10, that's good enough, time unit a dot seconds, right? So give me 10 seconds and wrap this up. OK. What are we going to do within the executor service? Well, let's go ahead and say uh, for i equal to 0, i less than max, uh, uh, and i plus plus. Let's just push into this executor service. So let's go back. And this becomes executor service dot submit. And uh, let's do a index is equal to i. and this becomes a call to the do work method, pardon me, do work, uh, the fetch method, right? And let's print the index right there, comma, what else you want to send? Some file, let's say sample.java, right? It could be a different file, but we'll just keep it simple. So, so what's going to happen with this particular code? Ooh, interrupt, uh, interrupted exception not handled. Well, we know exactly how to take care of those things, right? So, uh, so we'll fix it, so uh, exception. So essentially, uh, let's go ahead and see what the code does. So if I go back here to the code and uh, run the code, I want to I wanna take a look at the output. I'm going to take that into a file, let's say result, and I'm going to sort the result so we can see it a little bit better. Uh, result uh, one, 
and the result is going to be the one we want to take a look at. Let's do a look at the result. Notice this was thread one, thread one, thread two, thread two, thread three, thread three, four, four. They made it really easy on us, right? So that's saying, come on over. I'm going to stay with you until the entire thing is over. And this is like, I'm doing an IO. Don't worry about it. I'm still here, right? And it just waits around for the whole thing to be over. That's basically what the thread is doing, right? So the thread is waiting for the whole thing to be over. Now, this is good so far, but we want to use a virtual thread. Now, the first rule to keep in mind, uh, do not confuse executor service with pooling. It's important to separate those two in our mind. They are not the same. Do you use pooling with executor services? We do, but that doesn't mean that's the only way we have to do it. Because if you remember, uh, if you remember, uh, if you go to executor service, uh, so executor service, uh, executors, right? So if you go to the executors and look at the methods, notice there is a method called new single thread executor. This has been around for a long time. Uh, some of us may have used it. This is to say, just give me one thread. And that's all this executor is going to have, one thread. Why would you do that with only one thread? This is kind of like the actor model, right? You're saying, I can have multiple requests coming in, but only one will keep executing at the same time. When I'm finished with one job, I'll take the next job. So this prevents any problems with concurrency. So that's not a pool. That's one thread in it, right? For example, uh, similarly, um, you want to be able to run the virtual threads. But what you want to keep in mind is it makes no sense to pool virtual threads. Please don't. So it makes no sense to pool virtual threads. If somebody says, I want a pool of virtual threads, you like, why? OK, I'll make it easier for you to remember and to explain it. But I have to apologize before I say this. I like very gross analogy. The reason I like gross analogy is you will never forget it. So I sincerely apologize for this, but I want to use this analogy. So if you want to boo or ground, that's perfectly fine. So. Think of this like this. Virtual threads are like Q-tips. Please, this is gross, right? Somebody's using the Q-tips, and they are like, hey, do you want to reuse? Like, no. <laughs> Virtual threads are like Q-tips. Use and throw. Don't keep them around. So don't pull them, right? So that's the easiest way to remember. Metaphorically speaking, buy some Q-tips. Take it to work. If you have a colleague who wants to pool virtual threads, hand them a few and say, well, what would you do with this? And use that analogy to show that, right? This doesn't make any sense. And you want to throw them away. It's a use and throw. Why? Because virtual threads are cheap and they can Threads are expensive, relatively speaking. We pool threads because we don't want to be creating threads after threads after thread. Threads because you're going to increase the garbage collection. With virtual threads, they're cheap. And they get mounted and unmounted. So assign a thread, virtual thread, do your work, get rid of it. So as a result in this particular case, if you will, let's go back to this code for a second. And when we run this code, you saw that output. But notice what I'm going to do. I'm going to just do one change. That's it. Just one change. And, and what's a change I'm going to make? Pardon me, not there, over here. So I'm going to say executor service, not a fixed thread pool. I don't want that. Instead, what I'm going to do is to bring in new virtual thread per task executor. Just give me one. You got this Q-tips box. Every time you need, pick one. And every time you need, pick one, right? 
That's basically what this is doing. I'm going to pick one when I need. So that's your new virtual thread task uh, executor. So run that one right there instead. So notice the only change I made in the code was flipping those two lines, right? That's all I did. So if you use this one, you're using the traditional threads in your code. But instead of that, if you simply turn that into a new virtual thread per task executor, what, what happened right now? So if I go back over here and, and let's run this code one more time and see what its output is, there you go. But let's go ahead and save that as a result and let's sort the result so we can see what it produces. And in this case, I want to take a look at, again, we'll do a little more on this and take a look at it. So when you do this, notice the zero and the zero. That is worker eight to worker one. And look at the next one, one and one, worker nine to worker two. Look at the next one, that is three and three, that's coincidence. And look at five and four, right? That means it can do that if it wants to, right? Hey, uh, this happens occasionally, right? You call a company, and uh, the same person who picked up the call yesterday picks up today, because you could recognize the voice, right? But oftentimes, it's a different person. It's kind of like that. So right there is 5 and 4, 2 and 5, uh, 6 and 6, and 1 and 7, and you get the point. So that's basically the mounting and unmounting. So what did we notice in this particular case? What we noticed was that when you are calling this file uh, dot lines, uh, it says, oh, I don't need to uh, wait for you to finish that I.O. I can jump in and I can keep moving forward, I'll unmount it. So the unmounting happened and the mounting happened when you came back. So that's why the threading model was, uh, threading was different between those two calls. Oh, yes, please. Yes, good, good question. Sleeps, uh, beautiful, beautiful. Um, so uh, if you say try thread.sleep, right? Let's say a five second delay uh, in here. Um, so in this case, a regular thread will be sleeping, but a virtual thread will be unmounting. So, so that's good news. So in this case, uh, let's say for a minute, right? Just for the sake of discussion, I'm going to comment that out and, uh, and, and simply say uh, the var number of lines is equal to zero, just to illustrate the point, right? That's all I'm going to do. So if I were to go back and run the code again, and uh, pardon me. So if I were to go back and run the uh, code again, and, uh, and then uh, take a look at the result, yeah, that's going to, uh, how much did I create? 10, right? Yeah, there you go. So now uh, I'll sort the result one more time and uh, result uh, dot one, and uh, let's just more result one, just to take a look at it, right? So you can see that it's switching between those two again. So, so virtual threads uh, don't uh, sleep your thread. It does unmounting. But to your point, this is one of the challenges. You need to take the time to thoroughly understand which things unmount and which things don't. That is the catch. My recommendation is uh, write down functions that mount and functions that don't mount and put them on the back of the t-shirt of your colleague. So while you're coding, you can look at it, right? Because otherwise you may not remember it. But that's a challenge you have to go through. And don't assume everything is unmounting and mounting. Uh, for example, if you are calling Remember the lock interface? So you have an interface called java.util.concurrent. I think it's lock.lock, .lock, right? So you have a lock interface. Don't quote me on the exact place where it is. If you're using the lock interface and you are going to do the lock and unlock using the interface, uh, it will mount and unmount right now. But if you're using synchronized in your code, it will not mount and unmount. So synchronization holds the thread hostage, whereas lock and unlock will release the thread unmounted. Similarly, there are differences with different functions 
in the JDK and in the Java language as well that you may use. So you need to be very careful knowing that. And, and, the, and the short answer for that is <laughs> learn from the documentation, right? Uh, you, you can't really look at any specific things to look at, so you need to understand. Um, I've been using this for a while now, uh, when, when it was in development, and I would see certain functions going from being in a not supporting mounting and unmounting to starting to support mounting and unmounting. So that was a journey I was, I was watching, uh, and, and a lot of functions were converted. This is a really, really hard work, and I really have the deepest respect for uh, the team that went through so much trouble to make our lives much better and making the ecosystem better, right? So uh, definitely kudos for what they did. Uh, they have my utmost admiration for doing it. It's a lot of work, a lot of effort. And, and that's what they do, uh, did to take, it, uh, take care of it, but we need to take the time to learn what, what supported, what's not supported at that point. Uh, so from the executor service to using virtual thread, but executors should not be pooled, uh, keep that in mind. So where does it really make sense to use virtual threads? It makes sense to use virtual threads when you have a mounting and unmounting blocking operations. So if you have mounting and unmounting blocking operations, this is a great candidate. Uh, what is the benefit of that? The benefit is your thread is not blocked and waiting, it unmounts and goes on. Uh, I was running an ex experiment uh, a couple of weeks ago where I took an application that was using uh, executor service with the new fixed thread pool. And I measured the number of threads this application was taking, and it was performing I.O. So it was taking a lot of threads. And then we were like, if one more performance, you got to keep increasing the threads. We turned that into a virtual thread, and then we were monitoring the application, and the number of threads at the operating system level simply shrunk quite small. And, and that's the benefit you see. With less, uh, with fewer number of threads, you're able to get the same throughput, which, which, which means you can keep increasing your computations to get uh, much more uh, scalability. So, so the number one benefit of this is scalability of your applications. Uh, your servers can enjoy. Uh, and did you notice it did not take a lot of effort to be able to do it, isn't it? The only thing you need to remember is, tell the boss it takes a lot of time, right? It's gonna take about three, three weeks of effort, and, and it has to be done by the beach, right? And then, you know what to do, the rest is you can take it up from there, right? So, so it's really not a whole lot of effort if we know what we are doing that is. That's one of the biggest benefits you get out of this. Uh, of course, uh, don't pool, like I talked about, so don't pool threads, uh, virtual threads, uh, and this is where the sh paradigm shifts, isn't it? If somebody says, I'm gonna create threads, you're like, are you out of your mind? If somebody says, I wanna pool virtual threads, the same response. So it flips completely. Don't create threads, but create virtual threads. Uh, but of course, you don't have to manually create them. You can use the APIs like we saw, where the executor service can keep creating threads, so that works really nicely as well. And also take the time to really, really learn what functions are mounting and unmounting, what are not. Otherwise, you might be really uh, surprised that it's not giving you the performance you're expecting. The next thing I want to emphasize here is, if you have computationally intensive operations, you're crunching numbers, you're doing math operation. I worked, I worked in applications where we throw a bunch of data and the computer works on it for a long time doing CPU intensive operation. Uh, on, on some machines, especially when you're doing testing, you can hear the fan running because you're burning the CPU so hard. So, so the point really is, if you have competition intensive jobs, no, no use of giving it virtual thread. Because once you are assigned, it mounts and holds on to it, so you don't get any benefit of uh, having virtual thread. On the contrary, you have this overhead of mounting and unmounting that happened. Why bother with that, right? So that's not gonna be useful. Now I want to switch back and for the next several minutes talk about one fundamental shift we saw just now. Before the break, you saw me write completable future, but one of the challenges with completable future is, notice how you have that pipeline. And, and, and the railway track pattern is beautiful in concept, but in reality, that code becomes really unmaintainable. 
But this goes back to one of my complaints that I often have. I'm a big, big fan of functional programming. But I'm also of the belief that there are times when one solution is really good, but then it reaches a point of diminishing return. And I have some friends who will only do functional programming. And they will argue endlessly that writing functional code is the only way to write the code. We are still good friends. We meet for dinner. We just don't talk about this anymore. And, and the point is, I like to choose the technology or the solution or the paradigm that gives me the best results. I, do I use functional programming? I do a lot. But when do I shy away from that? If my code has a lot of impurity, if I have a lot of exceptions, I ask the question, is this still the right thing to do or are there better ways to do it? So from the programming model point of view, one of the biggest improvements or changes is, is this in my mind is, is pretty exciting. So let's think about this for a minute. Now, just to think about it, uh, in the past, this is like I'm talking about uh, you know, 10 years ago uh, or, or earlier. In the past, the structure, uh, structure of uh, imperative, let's say, style, uh, imperative style, a uh, parallel code, right? A parallel code was, uh, uh, you know, was very uh, different from the structure of imperative style sequential code. And in fact, most of you know this. You had this beautiful looking sequential code. And you came to work every day, you saw it, you understood it, it was easy to understand, easy to maintain, it was quite manageable. You actually smiled at your colleagues because it felt good to be at work. And then you started introducing threads into the code. What happened? That code that was so beautiful turned into a monster. You couldn't even recognize it. You take a few photos of the code, you put it on the wall and look at it. Back in time, it was like this, right? Whereas now, it's such a horrible monster. And, and that's kind of the way the code turns, isn't it? Now, uh, in Java 8, we had a big breakthrough, right? In Java 8, the structure of functional style parallel code is the same as the structure of Imper uh, sorry, a uh, uh, structure of functional style uh, uh, sequential code uh, thanks to whom should we thank? That's right, streams, right? Streams. So thanks to streams. And, and streams made this happen for us. You write the code as a stream, you can make it parallel stream. Not that it doesn't have any caveats, but it was very, very powerful and easier to use. Uh, in also Java 8, the structure of functional style, uh, this is going to be asynchronous uh, uh, code, uh, is the same as the uh, structure uh, of functional style uh, synchronous, I could say, uh, code. Again, you could say thanks to, who should we thank? That's right, completable future, you got it. Now, look at the sad part though. In order for you to make use of it, you had to write code in functional style. Like I said, I love functional style. But the problem is, functional style is great. But working with impurity and exceptions uh, is very difficult and we lose the elegance and the uh, understandability uh, of it, right? So this is one of the problems, is we tend to really lose out on some of this. So, uh, so understandability goes really, right, understandability. Let's see if this is happy with me. Okay, so, so that becomes really hard if you are not careful with it. So that is one of the problems you're going to run into is that it's not really that uh, elegant to work with. So in Java, I'm just going to say 21, the structure of finally imperative style uh, asynchronous code uh, is the same as the structure of 
imperative style synchronous code and in this case of course thanks to virtual threads so to me this is one of the biggest benefits we gain from this model it resets the uh, 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 levels of a playing field you are able to use an imperative style of code when you want to deal with exceptions when you need to deal with impurity uh, you don't have to force yourselves to uh, use a functional style because it's hard to do it another way. You can write the code synchronously. You can test it. You can make sure it's working fine. And if you need to really scale it, you can turn that into a, a virtual thread like I, uh, like I did. Your code is here, but you can change the threading model up here in terms of changing your executor service from using a fork join pool or using a regular uh, pool or to a virtual thread and uh, ask it to create virtual threads for you. So, so this gives you that benefit of the ability to change the threading model at, at a different situation. Uh, and the benefit of this is uh, we are good at handling exceptions in imperative style. Not only are we good at handling exceptions in the imperative style, guess what? you can handle multiple levels of exception much more effectively. You are in the catch block, and in the catch block, I, I once worked on a system where I would perform an operation. If that succeeded, great, keep going. If that failed, switch over to an alternate service and get the data from there, which means I've got a nested try and catch for the next service. And when you go through these multiple levels of exception, we know how to do that really well in imperative style. Try doing multiple levels of exception in the functional style. It's very hard to have a team that survives that. That becomes really, really hard to write that code. It becomes really messy, and, uh, and exceptions are messier, and completable future uh, becomes even more messy. And I don't know how to break this, so I'm going to say it very bluntly. And that is, after Java 21, it is a grim realization that completable future has no future. So that's the unfortunate you know, point, isn't it? Because you, you are like, Kish, well, gosh, why would I want to do that? Because that is so messy to write. And the more I look at it, as much as I like functional style of programming, that's not very elegant. And, and, and at least in my opinion, this really is going to kill completable future um, from the point of view of programming asynchrony because I truly believe that virtual threads provides a better alternative uh, than uh, using completable future. So completable future is great if you're still using pre-Java 20. But uh, keep in mind, keep that uh, in, in your you know, uh, uh, peripheral vision to say, hey, I don't think I want to do this too often uh, because where you really want to go is virtual threads. But this also brings up yet another point, in my opinion. Uh, a, a number of us uh, probably are on Java 17. Uh, uh, some of us are Java 11. Uh, some of them uh, that I know are in Java 8. Uh, that is really setting you uh, way back. Uh, if you're writing code that requires asynchronous programming, among other things, that's a huge disadvantage not moving forward in versions of Java. So this could be a good reason uh, to really find all the effort you can put in so you can move forward in versions of Java because there's so much to benefit. Not just, you know, if I go to my boss and say, I want to move to Java, like why? Because I can write better code. They say, don't worry, we'll buy you more pizza, right? So that doesn't help really convince it. But if I go to my boss and say, I want to move to 21, like why? Because you can spend less money uh, on your production infrastructure, they're like, keep talking, right? Because they want to hear how you can save their money. They don't care about you writing better code or productive code or you enjoy writing code. They're like, don't worry about it. Their enjoyment comes in other ways. We'll get you more pizza. But on the other hand, when you tell them that this actually makes applications scalable, not just tell them, do a prototype somewhat realistic to your application. When you do the prototype, Measure the number of threads it's using. Measure the number of threads it's using with virtual threads. Show that and, and the prototype and say, hey, if we move to 21, here is the benefit we get. 
you can send less money all the way to these cloud uh, services. You will still use the cloud because there are other benefits, definitely, but you're going to save the cost. You can reduce the cost of doing this. You got better scalability. We got better throughput. And if you're able to create a small prototype and demonstrate it, I think you are going to get this, uh, you know, a corporate uh, desire to move forward, even if they were holding back at other times. And that's definitely a big win for us to do. I hope this was useful. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it.